it's with the greatest honor that I can introduce Dr. Natasha Vitamore uh, as the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Vitamore is recognized for her work concerning the impacts of technology and the human future. The scope of her work covers science, technology, and social political issues. Her personal aim is to accelerate regenerative, regenerative generations, promote the mindset of ageless thinking. She is called an early adapter of revolutionary changes by Wired and a role model for super longevity by Village Voice and featured in over two dozen, two dozen televised documentaries on emerging technologies, human enhancement and life extension. Her pioneering writing on ageless thinking, her innovation, new human, and their current work on regenerative generation have vigorously established a strong incentive to many. In the field of science, her research proved to be a scientific breakthrough in the long-term memory in the field of cryobiology. So it's my greatest pleasure that I pass on the word to Dr. Natasha Vitamore. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to not use a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to talk to you all. Um, there's a, a couple of ideas that have sprung up from the speakers and I've listened intently to each one and I have been educated by each one uh, in ways that were surprising and ways that I, I had already expected having known some of the speakers for years. A couple of points I'd like to make in beginning that if we cut off credibility we lose ourselves. And I want to approach my talk, my presentation on that sentiment that credibility ought to be held at its highest level in all work that we do across the spectrum of talents and skills. And it is that credibility that speaks for ourselves. It introduces us before we introduce ourselves or are introduced it stands before us. And along with credibility is the sense of self-ownership. I am my person, I am responsible for the wonderful good things I do. And I'm also responsible for the unwise and um, often disparaging things I do, just like everyone else. That is part of being human. Those characteristics are innate. They're part of what most theoreticians call human nature. Some may argue against human nature, but we do have a nature. We are a species, we are a being. And that nature is shared across our genetic DNA spectrum, our genomics. So each of us are different to be sure, but we share the same loves, fears, passions, curiosities to different degrees. And then we determine the fields that we're going to go into and we try to do something meaningful within those fields. Heading back to credibility, one issue that I, I find that needs to be spoken is to, we're all in love with longevity. We're all pretty much in love with artificial intelligence and possibilities and abundance and universal basic income and whatever economic structure that suits it best the health and longevity of everyone. That's part of being human. That's part of the innate compassion that we hold. Now, certainly not everyone has that. There are certain diseases and, and cognitive issues and mental illnesses that interrupt that flow. Those have been identified for the large part, but generally speaking, we share this. So one thing I'd like to stress is that it's so important to know what lane you're in, know where you excel and shine in that lane. Most of us want to be in several different lanes simultaneously because it's hip or it's cool or it sounds good or it brings us media attention. But long and short of it is eventually we will find our place and then grow and absorb feedback that helps us even grow further. So I wanted to make that note on credibility because in my view, the transhumanist agenda is based on that type of credibility. There's another point I wanted to make as well. Ideas are envisioned, manufactured, 
parroted, cut and paste. And today we see a lot of ideas on the different concepts of AI, nanotech, biotech, infotech, blockchain, uh, encryption, uh, longevity. It's very important to go to the source to make sure that in our research, in our work, that we take the time to look at who are the purveyors of those ideas, who are the nascent thinkers, where did those ideas come from and then build off of them? This is very scholarly and as an academic, I've learned that this is the only way to survive academics. But as a scientist as well, it's the only way to survive science because science is based on evidence. And if you don't have your evidence, then people will say, well, where did that come from? One thing I learned from my dear friend, Aubrey de Grey, was how to write a scientific paper. He published my scientific breakthrough in his journal, and I had to jump through loops learning how to write a scientific paper. And it's not easy. I'm assuming it's just as difficult as writing a technological paper on very important detailed schemata. And writing a dissertation, which I know very well how to do at this point, is difficult as well. Yet the three different strategies, three different styles. And those are just three of the many different styles. Philosophers have one way, theoreticians have another, priest, minister, spiritualist, politicians all have different ways. Find your way and focus on it and master it. And that goes back to the issue of credibility. When ideas are spread, sometimes they miss, not intentionally, maybe by mistake, maybe someone cut and pasted a little bit differently than the way it was originally stated or the original intention. So intentionality is a very important topic to discuss. When we're talking about longevity and artificial intelligence and nanotechnology and emerging speculative areas and toward the singularity. Because if something's missing, the whole message could be askewed and obfuscated. So we want to be careful that in our work, no matter how scholarly you are or not, it doesn't matter. I value, like Gurdjieff taught me in his writings, to value everyone equally, no matter if you're the person who sweeps the street and picks up my garbage, or is the person who's going to give me a million dollars to do further research on transhumanism. You're equal in my view, because we're all of the same species. I think that the transhumanist agenda has placed that forward, that we are diverse. We appreciate multiplicity. We look for equality, but not equality that makes everyone the same. We do need some people to soar higher and faster and wider than others in their area. We need people to learn how to grow and become better, more experienced, more knowledgeable in their area. I can learn a lot from the person who doesn't even have a high school degree, as much as I can learn from the person with three masters and 12 PhDs. It doesn't matter. What matters is authenticity. And again, going back to the word, of credibility. I'd like to talk about something that really is dear to my heart. And that's the issue of my talk topic. My talk topic is radical life extension and enhancement and the mind, the brain, and then looking towards the transhumanist manifesto. I wanna clear up some ideas here so that we're all well informed. I'm going to refer to my notes so I'm accurate here. There are several terms that are being used in the, in the domain of, of looking at extending life. Life extension, longevity, super longevity, and radical life extension. These all cross over a little, but we need to be really clear on what they originally meant and how they've transversed their original meaning, but to use them in appropriate ways. First, life extension is extending life. And it means living longer. It means the maximum lifespan originally. So life extension is extending the amount of years a person is alive, well and healthy 
to the time the person is no longer alive. It is not extending the maximum lifespan of 123.5 some opt years. So that's basically life extension. Longevity is a little bit different while it's, it's packaged with life extension. Longevity is more about squaring the curve. So you grow and you're really healthy at age one or zero, zero human, and then you age. And as you age, you start declining in your physical and cognitive abilities. So what we want to do is square that so you stay longer, healthier. And that is longevity, taking a look at the maximum lifespan and extending that. Now, this is where super longevity comes in. That means truly, seriously extending that maximum lifespan to 150, 200 indefinitely. So super longevity also ties into the concept of radical life extension. And radical life extension is a lovely term because of the word radical. So we look at what radical means. Radical is the other, it's beyond, it's different, it's taking um, challenges, it's um, taking risks. So by being radical, you're saying, I'm not going to stay with the norm of what is expected. I'm going to steer higher, reach broader, do better than what is expected of this normalcy of what a human is supposed to be. So the radical part on life extension is very important in that way. Radical life extension was a concept that we developed in the 1990s at some of the conferences that we put on. And Jose Codero mentioned some of his colleagues and friends who also spoke early on at our conferences. And these are put on in Silicon Valley and in other communities, Los Angeles. And we said, well, we want to be radical. So we want to look at nanomedicine. We want to look at genetic engineering. And we ardently want to look at human enhancement with artificial intelligence and or artificial general intelligence. So radical added to life extension gives it that, that you know, can do radical challenge. What's next? Exponential, um, new, evolving, emerging technologies of all possibilities. I wanted to make that very clear so that when we use these terms, we understand what they, what they mean from the get-go. And again, you can use them as you choose, but just realize that when you're using them, other people may interpret them slightly differently. So we want to increase the maximum lifespan through the ethical use of technology and evidence-based science. And that goes back to the science. We do not want to repeat what Elizabeth Holmes did with um, Theramos. And that brought the longevity, life extension, radical life extension community to a little bit of a minor standstill because what we wanna do is make sure that the science we're talking about is doable, has been tested. Not necessarily by the FDA, it's a little bit too conservative for most of us, or a lot too conservative. But we wanna make sure that when we're talking about a scientific breakthrough, or a, a therapy for, for radical life extension or super longevity and even longevity, that there is some evidence there. And then we research where that evidence comes from. The um, issue of my talk is in the first sentence I have, genetic liability or uh, genetic liberty. Well, here I'm gonna go with genetic liberty. So right now as homo sapiens sapiens, as humans, we have genetic liability. We are issued genes hereditarily as offspring. Now those genes are like Russian roulette, they're randomized. And we can go to 23andMe or other um, institutions, companies that will take a look at our DNA and give us some feedback on the basic DNA of that we have for $100 or less. Or we can spend more money and have a more thorough assessment of our DNA. However, we still have, that doesn't erase the fact that all humans have genetic, genetic liability. No one is perfect, no one is privileged. I may have a certain IQ that may be higher or lower than someone else. I feel genetically at a liability that because I'm not six feet tall, for example, or maybe I want a darker skin, for example, or maybe I wish I didn't have skin cancer. So each one of us, based on our hereditary, have a genetic liability. So no one is any better than, off than anyone else in reality. 
And that's based on the whole spectrum of characteristics of being human. So what I suggest is genetic liberty. Let's liberate ourselves from this liability and be able to select our genes, to have therapies, engineering, whatever protocols are safe and healthy and wise to use to alter. And I think Nell Watson nailed it with her whisking. Let's whisk our genes and get a better assessment of our own genome so that we have a healthier genome for this future. The COVID-19 pandemic, as well as all pandemics, have been a threat to our humanity, our lives. And I think Anders Sandberg said it just beautifully when he said, it's not over yet. Even if we um, upload, even if we cross load or, or coexist on other or within other substrates, there will always be some kind of anti anti antagonistical element, whether it's a computer virus, a biological virus, a bacteria, something that we have to challenge and protect ourselves from. So make no bones about that, it's a fact. Um, another point I wanna make is Max Moore's talk when he talked about the um, universal basic income and that we need a better economic structure so that looking at the survey, it showed that the majority of people do want to provide human rights to the masses and some kind of basic income because automation is around the corner, number one. The pandemic has shown us that many of us have lost our, our jobs, our basic income, so we need some kind of solution to that. We don't have it yet. We're still pondering it and theorizing it, but that's an issue we need to discuss in the future. All this ties into our genetic liability, that we don't have the cognitive prowess to be able to articulate solutions across spectrums of data that is coming at us fast and rapidly. So we need the aid of AI and we need to integrate that AI, excuse me. So the need to augment with AI, repair with nano robots, enhance genetic liberty and to build environments that support health and super longevity and our radical life extension are fundamental to the RAD life extension manifest. Now, with that said, I have to turn to the Transhumanist Manifesto. And all of this was written in the Transhumanist Manifesto in 1983. And I don't see it very much on the internet and I take total, sole responsibility of that. I was a bit lame. Um, I wrote it before we had the internet. I wrote it before we had the World Wide Web. I wrote it when I was, quote, an artist and wasn't looking to be me too and selfies and Instagram. In fact, in my generation of being a former artist, I was a performance artist as well as filmmaker and videographer. And yes, I have exhibited museums and won awards and accomplished a great deal, but it didn't suit me. I was more interested in science and technology. So I left that world behind, but it still is part of my, my persona, my psyche. When I wrote the Transhumanist Manifesto, it was in 1983. So that's a long time before we have all the knowledge we have today. And the Transhumanist Manifesto has gone through a couple of revisions and it's available online for anyone to read. And I'll also put it in the, in the YouTube window and make it available uh, for you all. But I think it's important because it was written at a time when we didn't have the nanotechnologies and the genetic engineering and the stem cells and all the different AI, um, applications and visions of Ben Gertzwell and team at Singularity Net. So I think that that shows some credence that there were many of us early on that thought about longevity and humanity and had being a more conscious, benevolent, kinder humanity. Now, I was not the first to think of that. Of course, there's Pierre de Chardin, there is um, Julian Huxley, there was um, so many others, T.S. Eliot, there was FM 2030 or FM Espondiari. There have been philosophers, theoreticians over time. Um, there was uh, Fedorov and Fanot who thought that we shouldn't die, that we should regenerate uh, humans. 
this is all important because the whole sentiment of the transhumanist agenda is historical, and that is the beauty of it. And here I want to mention the talk of Michael Masucci yesterday, who talked about STEAM, the need for not only science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but arts as well, because it is through the arts, through filmmaking, videos, painting, stories, poetry, dance, theater, music, all these modalities are part of what makes us human. And we wanna carry that forward through transhumanism to make it even greater. So now I'm gonna tell you a short little story. Werner Vinge, who authored the concept of the technological singularity, um, met with me some years ago in the early 1990s. And we had a chat at his um, um, uh, office at the university where he was teaching in Southern California. And I said, okay, so what happens when we hit the singularity and AI has sapience and sentience? What happens there um, when we have all this, what happens to the arts? Will people still want, desire poetry and dance and music? And he said, yes. So we coined a term together and we called it the creativity augmentum. So at a point with the technological singularity, it's also the point of the creativity argumentum, where our intelligence, our creativity are enhanced. Do I think that's a bad thing as an artist and scientist and, tech, and techno um, advocate? Yes, I do. We would not be able to have people like Zoltan Espan, who has a charisma that we all adore, or Max Moore's charisma, or Ben Gertzwell's, or Jose, or Ibi, or any of the speakers, Nell included, and the speakers we'll have later on today, all have a charisma to share with us. But again, I'm gonna go back to my main message. Be in your lane, be yourself. If you're a scientist, talk about the science of longevity or super longevity. If you're a politician, talk about the politics we need. We need them desperately, inform us, educate us. If you're a technologist working with AI, help us with augmentation and improving ourselves. If you're someone who's an economist, help us figure out the economy for the future with automation and universal basic income or universal basic capitalism. If you're a doctor, help us find personalized medicine or preferred medicine. So if you're someone who is helping us on any level, remember that the gift that you have is your own uniqueness, your own individuality. So I'm gonna check time. Um, how much time do I have? I always, I'm a timekeeper person. Okay. One minute. One minute? Okay. So to sum up, the Transhumanist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. The Transhumanist Manifesto written in 1983 said everything that was said today, but it said it poetically. Since then it was updated in um, 1998, when I designed the first whole body prosthetic, so I added augmentation, enhancement, and genetic engineering to it based on the and nanomedicine, based on the technologies we had at that time. It was further updated in 2008 when transhumanism started becoming politicized. And I do not think transhumanism needs to be or benefits from being politicized. I think that transhumanism as a worldview as a philosophy, as a practice, is how we each practice it. And how we practice it is how we live our lives, being healthy, paying or playing it forward, sharing our knowledge, and being as authentic as we can in who we are. To catch people when they're doing a no-no, to love them regardless, but to let them know, I'm not gonna stand for that, stop it and to engage those who are doing things that are wonderful, boost them, credit them, encourage them. We need more encouragement, we need more rigor in our critical thinking, and we need to pay attention to how we can make this future a better place beyond scarcity, beyond mortality, and beyond cruelty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha. Um, all right, so there is one question that I would still like to ask you, and that is about the meaning of life without death. What do you say to people that only find meaning in life when there is death? What do I say to people who claim that there is only meaning in life if there is death? I say, 
go get a life. Okay, I, if I, uh, honestly, I was at a, a conference in Amsterdam. I was on um, stage at the Opera House uh, debating the issue of life. And um, a journalist from the uh, New Atlantic said to me, you want too much life. It's like having too much chocolate. And I said, what's wrong with chocolate? So I think that one of the issues here is that people think that if you want more life, there's somehow to eating too much candy, you're, you're having too much sex, or you're having too much happiness. Well, what's wrong with that, for goodness sakes? Uh, the more happiness, the better. Now, of course, too much chocolate can be dangerous, too much alcohol can be dangerous. But the bottom line is, death is a myth. That life is valued because we live a certain time and then we await death is a myth that was um, actually tossed down our throats through different um, philosophical and religious um, precedents of trying to find a way to help reduce or relieve the pain of death. Death is sad, it's painful when we lose a loved one. So to assuage the public, it was made that life is purposeful if there's death. Not so.